My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a cardiologist in York. Today I'm going to talk on the subject of MINOCA. Now the term MINOCA stands for myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronary arteries. I'll try and explain this a bit better by using a case study. A 50-year-old lady was admitted to my hospital with crushing chest tightness. We did an ECG and that suggested that there were some changes in keeping with the lack of blood getting to the heart. We did a blood test to measure troponin. Troponin uh, is an enzyme that is released from the heart when the heart has been damaged. And in this lady, the troponin was found to be elevated. On the basis of these findings, we told her that she had suffered a heart attack. She asked me, why I felt she had had a heart attack and I explained to her that she had had chest pains and the blood test indicating damage to the heart was elevated and that was all we needed to say that she had had a heart attack. Clearly she was quite upset. She then asked me what would happen next and I said to her that the heart attack is probably caused by a very severe narrowing or even a blockage of one or more of the blood vessels, the coronary vessels, that supplied blood to the heart. And the next step would be to do a test called an angiogram to look at her coronary vessels, identify exactly where the narrowings were and fix them. And she agreed and we performed an angiogram and we were fully expecting a blockage. But interestingly, we didn't find any. She had some very minor plaque, but the plaque was certainly not causing a major narrowing in our heart arteries. And certainly there was nothing there that could explain the heart attack, i.e. that could explain that for some reason the blood going to the heart had been obstructed. And therefore she was discharged with a diagnosis of minoka, i.e. to all intents and purposes, what we were saying by saying that she'd had a minoka was that we thought she'd had a heart attack, but without significant obstructive disease in her coronaries. Now, this is what I'm going to talk about, Minoka. We have known that patients can present with heart attacks in the absence of obstructive coronary disease for over 80 years, but the term Minoka has only really been used um, for about the past seven to eight years. Minoka is not an uncommon diagnosis. Up to between five and 15% of all patients who present with a heart attack are found to have unobstructed coronary vessels and therefore diagnosed with minoka. The problem is that as nothing major is found, there is nothing to fix. And this leaves the poor patient very perplexed and uncertain about their future. Whilst traditional heart attacks are seen in older patients and more men than women, minoka tends to be seen more in younger women, women under the age of 55, and genetics and psychological stress are also risk factors for minoka. Whilst it is reassuring to find that heart the heart arteries are not obstructed, Minoka should not be considered a benign diagnosis because the heart has still suffered damage. And we know that because this blood test, the troponin is elevated. And these areas of damage can cause the heart to become irritable and cause dangerous heart rhythm disturbances. In addition, the heart can still be left weak as a result of the damage, leading to heart failure. And of course, the underlying problem can still manifest with another heart attack and therefore more damage in the future. And therefore, Minoka should not be considered a benign diagnosis. It is important for me to stress that Minoka is not a complete diagnosis in itself, but rather an umbrella term for patients who present like the lady that I have talked to you about did. Uh, there are lots of underlying causes that could explain Minoka, and this is why the diagnosis of Minoka should prompt more detailed and more sophisticated investigation. The, the causes of Minoka can generally be divided into three groups. Coronary causes, something going on with the heart, the blood vessels of the heart. Cardiac causes, something going on with the heart itself, but not the blood vessels. And then non-cardiac causes. And I'll go through each of them uh, in turn. So coronary causes include coronary artery spasm. In this scenario, for some reason, the coronary vessel, even though it's not blocked and narrowed, goes into spasm. 
and the blood does not get through, the heart gets damaged, but by the time we look, the spasm has resolved and the coronaries look unobstructed. So that's one possibility. Coronary artery embolism. In this scenario, a blood clot which forms elsewhere somehow finds its way into the heart, goes, it goes down a coronary artery, causing a blockage. But by the time we do the angiogram, because when someone comes in with a heart attack, we give them blood thinning medications, aspirin, etc. Those medications can dissipate the clot. And therefore, by the time we go to do the angiogram, you see unobstructed vessels. But this could be another mechanism. Another mechanism is coronary artery dissection. A tear happens in the wall of the coronary artery, and this creates a flap, which then obstructs the vessel transiently, causing the chest pain and the damage. Uh, another very common cause is coronary artery plaque rupture. So not uncommonly, a minor plaque may rupture, causing blood clots to form around the area. The blood clots stop the blood from getting through. And by the time you've come to look, the clots have dissipated because you've given them the blood thinning medications like aspirin, etc. And then, of course, microvascular disease. The blockage is occurring in tiny blood vessels, which are actually not big enough to be adequately visualized on the angiogram. So those are the coronary causes. Then you come to cardiac causes. So in terms of cardiac causes, a very common cause is myocarditis, an infection or inflammation of the heart muscle that will cause the heart muscle to become damaged. You will release the troponin and will also cause chest pain. Another cause is Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. Um, this is a stress-induced cardiomyopathy. A huge surge of stress hormones causes part of the heart to become paralyzed, and this leads to release of troponins and chest pain. Other forms of cardiomyopathy. Trauma, so for example, you know, if you're driving, you get hit by a car, you hit your chest on the seat, uh, on, the, on the steering, you get a lot of pain, and you can actually cause contusion of the heart, so trauma to the heart, and that can release the enzymes. And again, heart rhythm disorders. So if you have an irregular heartbeat or something like that, you can have a transient beat. The heart goes really, really fast. Here, the problem is not with the supply, but the demand. The demand has gone up excessively because the heart is going at like 200 beats per minute. You will release a little bit of troponin. You may get a bit of chest pain. You go to the doctor. By that time, the heart rhythm abnormality has resolved. So the patient, so the doctor doesn't see the heart rhythm disorder, but he sees the fact that you've had some chest pain and your blood test is raised. So heart rhythm disorders are another cause of minoca. And then you also have non-cardiac causes. Uh, so things that have nothing to do with the heart can also do this. Blood clots in the lung uh, in the lung can present with chest pain and a rise in troponins. Strokes, so a bleed in the head or a big stroke can sometimes cause ECG changes, may present with chest pain. Again, huge release of stress hormones and can cause a rise in the troponin. Sepsis, so infection is very common. If you get a bad pneumonia, that can release troponins and um, you may experience chest pain because of the pneumonia. Hypoxemia, so a lack of oxygen for any reason. If you are deprived of oxygen, that could do it. Blood clotting disorders, so if you have a blood clotting disorder, you may form blood clots and that could cause the problem. Even though the problem isn't within the heart, it's outside the heart i.e. the blood clotting disorder is something which is extra cardiac, but it may cause cardiac issues. So given the fact that so many conditions can cause a Minoka presentation, it is vital that, doc that the doctor looks further than just sending the patient home with this umbrella term of Minoka, because of some of the causes of Minoka, if identified, can be treated. So firstly, I think when you have a diagnosis of Minoka, it's very important your doctors go back and look at the angiogram and they reappraise the angiogram carefully to ensure that nothing has been missed and any narrowings haven't been under-egged uh, and been called as being less than what they are. So someone needs to look at the angiogram again and be absolutely sure. Remember, the angiogram is a two-dimensional image and obviously the coronary artery is a three-dimensional, so you can often get it wrong. When you look at the angiogram, you may say, oh, well, that looks okay, but you're not looking at the third dimension. So very important that uh, whoever's doing the angiogram does the angiogram from different views, uh, does a comprehensive test, and 
uh, lots of people with a fresh pair of eyes look at the angiogram to be absolutely confident that there are no significant narrowings or no evidence of this coronary artery dissection or something like that. Then I think it is important that the patient has an assessment of the function of the heart by means of an echocardiogram to look for cardiomyopathies, tachycubos, etc. It is very important, I think, to look to exclude blood clots in the lung because if you had a blood clot in the lung, your treatment would be completely different. You'd be put on proper anticoagulants and therefore it's important that this is not missed and also to look for evidence of heart rhythm disorders maybe by organizing prolonged heart rhythm monitoring for the patient it's important to look for evidence of infections such as myocarditis so you can do uh, serology for typical viruses that cause myocarditis and also look for blood clotting disorders uh, and some of these blood clotting disorders are particularly important not only because of what they mean for the patient, but also the fact that they could be passed on to future generations. Finally, if nothing is found, the patient should undergo an MRI scan. And I think all patients with a Minoka, where there's no obvious cause found, should have an MRI scan of the heart. The advantage of the MRI scan is that an MRI is very good at identifying scar in the heart. And the pattern of scar can sometimes help identify the cause of the Minoka. So the coronary arteries, you know, these blood vessels, they sit on the top of the heart like this. Uh, but they, they have these little tributaries or these little branches that go into the heart muscle, right? So into the heart muscle. So anything that blocks one of these blood vessels, which are sitting on top, will actually affect these tiny vessels first because they're the furthest away from the blockage so they're going to be the areas that are going to be affected first and therefore anything that will even transiently block the coronaries will cause the innermost layers of the heart to become damaged first and therefore the scar will always affect the innermost layer first and therefore coronary causes will always have a pattern of scar if there's a coronary cause the scar will always go from in outwards so the innermost layer of the heart will be the bit that will be affected first but with conditions such as myocarditis scar will not follow this distribution and will be more random and then there are other conditions like takotsubos which are not associated with the finding of any scar whatsoever there have been studies that have looked at this group of patients and they, what they've found is that up to 30 percent of patients with minoka are actually found as how to be having myocarditis by the MRI scan. So when you do an MRI scan, 30% will have actually got a, a myocarditis and you identify that because the scar is randomly distributed around the heart. 25% will have no scar. 20% will be confirmed as having a Takotsubo type of process. And 20% will have a traditional heart attack scar, the scar that goes from the inner layer outwards. And those people have a coronary cause of their heart attack. So Minoka, as I mentioned, is not a benign diagnosis. And the all-cause mortality is up to 3.5% at one year. And this is why it is important to look hard and correct the correctable. At present, we still do not have enough data on what medications to discharge these patients on, so they still go on the same medications as people with a traditional heart attack go on. But I suspect that in the next few years, we should have more data on which medications offer protection to Minoka patients and which don't. I think it's also really important that you don't want to carry the label of a heart attack if you haven't had a proper heart attack, I know they call it Minoka MI, a heart attack with no, non-obstructive coronaries. But if it were a myocarditis, then you shouldn't be labeled as having heart attack and you shouldn't have to have, take all those medications that heart attack patients have to take. And that is why having an MRI is important. And if anyone's watching this and you've been diagnosed with Minoka, please, please, please insist on your doctor doing an MRI scan because it may just clarify matters for you. I hope you found this useful. I appreciate you more than you can ever imagine. Thank you so much.